Hey, Chapel Street Church. We have an incredible history of student missions here at Chapel Street. And throughout the years, we've received unbelievable support from you, our church family, in order to help students experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact as we've served in places such as Milwaukee, Toronto, Mexico, Ecuador, and even last summer, all throughout Kane County on our first ever local student missions week. And I am so excited to announce to you that this summer, we have the opportunity for 90 of our high school students, grades nine through 12, to serve together as one team in one location, Twin Cities, Minnesota. Here's a few members of our team to share more about how you can partner with us as we serve for a week in the Twin Cities beginning on June 20th. Hey Chapel Street Church. Hi Chapel Street Church. Hey Chapel Street Church. Hey Chapel Street, my name is Ella Miller and I'm a part of the Twin Cities mission trip team. I'm mostly excited for this trip because I get to have the opportunity to serve people who are not within my community. I can't wait to see how God works through all of us, but also to take the next step in my walk of faith. I can't wait to show God's love to those around us through our actions of service. I'm excited for this trip because this will be my first ever missions trip. We will have the amazing opportunity to be able to serve the local families and children, and I hope that God will use me to bless and love on others this summer. We would love for you, our church family, to pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us as we serve together in the Twin Cities. We can't wait to come back and share the stories how God has worked in and through our team this summer. You know, there's nothing like seeing smiley faces of high school students talking about how excited they are to go on a missions trip. We've been doing missions trips with students for years, ever since I was youth pastor here many years ago. It's such an important part of the development and the growth of our student ministries, and we invite you to pray for our students as they go to serve God. You can do that by clicking the link that's available in the comment section, and that'll print out a little prayer card that you can have, and just to remind you to pray for these students, that God would fill them, use them, protect them, uh, and grow them in their heart for Him and for, the, and for what He's doing in the world. And we're glad you're part of that with us. Let's pray now as we launch into the sermon together. God, thank you for the way that you love us and provide for us. Thank you for the way that you're working our lives in everyday events and in big things like heading across state lines to serve you in other parts of the country. We ask you blessing over those students as they go to serve and over us right now as we come to your word, that you would open our minds and hearts and teach us what you want us to know about who you are and how we can follow you and reflect your glory in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, not long ago, I had a chance to take a uh, fly fishing trip to Montana with a group of pastors. Uh, I'm not much of a fly fisherman. In fact, I've never been before. And on this trip, I realized that I'm really not a fly fisherman at all. But the whole point of the trip was not fly fishing. It was spiritual renewal and retreat with some pastors in our same denomination. Here's a picture from that trip with, uh, at, the, at the Bighorn Reservoir. It was just gorgeous uh, outside of Billings, Montana on the Crow Indian Reservation. And we had a fantastic time. Uh, I didn't catch many fish, but I did grow in my faith, get to know some good brothers serving the Lord. But the story I want to tell you is uh, our journey back from Billings. We're 90 minutes from the city and from the airport, way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and we're packing up to leave. And we don't all have the same flight times. And some of these pastors are uh, used to flying, uh, and some of them aren't as much. Um, and I'm somewhere in the middle, and we're <laughs> stressing out about the time. I'm looking at my watch, I'm thinking about the time, I'm going, this is going to be cutting it close from my flight, and I'm not even the earliest flight. We even got into Billings and stopped for breakfast because our guide said, you've got to have these cinnamon rolls, they're the best in the world, you've got to have a cinnamon roll. I'm thinking, we don't have, I don't even want a cinnamon roll, I've had too many in my life, and we don't have time for this. And some of us are getting stressed out. One of the pastors who flies all the time is like, no big deal, we've got plenty of time. And there, uh, an argument broke out between a couple of pastors. Can you imagine that? One saying, we've got plenty of time. The other one saying, I just don't want to be late. And, and then this one guy says, listen, the worst thing would be to sit at the gate for, and have to wait there and be at the gate too early. And I'm thinking, that's exactly what I want. I like when I fly to get at the gate early, to sit and to wait and have a chance to read. And he was thinking, that's the worst thing that could happen. There's something about waiting that makes us nervous uh, and edgy, and we don't like it in our country. Years ago, I flew to Russia in, to, in 2002 to uh, serve on it with our church, helping support a church there in Samara, Russia. And when we, had, when we got off the plane, there was one customs agent, and the line was over 100 people long for one agent. I thought, this is crazy. When we finally got through, it was hours. I said to the, our driver, who was from the church, who picked us up, 
I said, I I've never seen a line that long with just one person. It took forever. He shrugged and said, this is Russia. <laughs> They're used to it. They wait differently than we do. Why is it that Americans have trouble waiting? What's our issue with waiting? For example, let's take a couple look at this. Does this image here of security lines at, at the TSA checkpoint make you feel comfortable or, or edgy and nervous? If I see this when I get to an airport, I get nervous. Or this image right here. Everybody loves the waiting room. We have rooms we call the waiting room, and they don't conjure up positive or pleasant ideas in our minds. Or this image. Probably the worst, right? DMV. You just know you're going to wait no matter when you go or which one you go to. We've been conditioned in America to think about waiting as a bad thing, as among the worst things that could happen to us. We go to the checkout line and you do the same thing I do. You evaluate which one is the shortest. And invariably, even though there's less people, you get behind somebody slow and you get all stressed out and irritable inside. I know that I do. But the biblical perspective on waiting is not only that it's not bad, but it's necessary. It's good for us. In fact, it's part of the Christian life. Let's read 2 Peter 3, verses 11 through 18. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Now, three times here, Peter's going to talk to us about waiting. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are, there it is again, waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people, and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So Peter's telling us three times in three verses at the beginning here that we're waiting. Specifically, we're waiting for what? He says, for the coming of the day of the Lord and for the new heavens and the new earth. We talked about this last week in the sermon. If you want to go back and listen to that, what the day of the Lord means and what judgment day is all about and what we're waiting for, I encourage you to do that. But our problem is we tend to associate waiting with um, passive passivity. We're not doing anything or it's wasting time. But that's not how Peter thinks about it, nor the biblical writers, or how we should think about it from a spiritual perspective as Christians. Peter's describing our waiting as an active process where something's happening in us and we're engaged in some things while we wait. He's really summarizing what he said throughout his letter. Um, and, and this is the, the last in our series called Faith That Finishes, the set letter of 2 Peter. Peter's wrapping up what he said. Let's go back to the first chapter, 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 4. His divine power has granted to us all things. Uh, this all things literally can be translated everything you need. That he's given us everything we need in Christ. That pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So Peter says, you have everything that you need in Jesus. All things. To live the life God's called you to, you lack nothing. He's given you everything you need. All things you already have. And he called, says that we're partakers in the divine nature by the promises of God. So really what Peter's saying throughout this entire letter is that Jesus is all-sufficient. In all of your life, in every area, for everything that you're facing, you have what you need in Christ. That's what he's saying. And this is backed up by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. He says, My God will supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Or in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for you. Jesus is sufficient. He, he will supply everything that you need. So this is the theme of Peter's letter. And this is why it's critical for us to understand if we're going to learn how to wait well. So if we're waiting for the new heavens and new earth reality, the coming day of the Lord, and waiting is a good thing, how do we wait well? How do we wait like Christians? 
Remember that uh, story about flying back from Montana? I was flying southwest. Those of you who know southwest, you know how that works. It's open seating, and you board based on letter and number. And so you try to check in early to get the A position, and I was A12, so I did pretty well. The guy in front of me was A11, obviously. And you stand between these stanchions based on your number. If you've flown southwest, you know this. Well, you're supposed to sit every, or stand every five. He had A11. He was standing between A6 through 10. But there was no person A10. The lady in front of him, A9, was really mad about this. And she kept saying, you need to get behind that pole. And he said, but there's nobody else. She said, you can't stand here. It's just a matter of where he stood. We hadn't even boarded the plane yet, and they broke out into an argument. So I'm pretty sure that's not waiting like a Christian. <laughs> what does it mean to wait like a Christian? How should we wait? What does it look like? I think part of my issue with waiting is that I, I, I'm worried or I'm anxious uh, that I'm going to miss out on something. I have FOMO, fear of missing out. Part of the issue with waiting is, am I going to get, that's the issue on Southwest, right? I've got to get a good position to get on first, to have room for my bag, get the seat that I want. And there's stress about that. Well, that's not how we're called to wait as followers of Jesus. Because we already know what we're waiting for is a sure thing. You have everything you need. His return is certain. There's, it's a rock-solid 100% guarantee. So there's no fear of missing out on anything. We're waiting with certainty, with hope. What the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25, Now in this hope we're saved, and if we're waiting in this hope, we wait for it with eager expectation, with a certainty. There's a connection, biblically speaking, between waiting and hope. All right, Peter gives us three instructions in the text we read a moment ago that help us to learn how to wait well. Here's the first. Pursue holiness. He tells us to pursue holiness. Now, when you hear the word holiness, don't think moral perfection. Only God is morally perfect. There's only one sinless man, that is the man Jesus. So when we're called to be holy, it's not to be perfect, but to be set apart, to live lives that are distinct, set apart from the culture to honor God. That's the purpose of, of the holiness in our lives. Here's what Peter says in 2 Peter 3, verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Lives that reflect the character and nature of God in the world. Distinct, set apart from. That's how you should think about what it means to be holy. I, when I was fly fishing in Montana, I know lots of stories about fly fishing, but I had a great time. Um, one of my guides was a young man named Colton. He grew up in Montana, fished all his life, fished competitively even. I didn't know that was a thing. But what he would show me, I kept tangling my line. I could not, I thought I was going to be Brad Pitt out there on the, like a river runs through it and perfect cast. But mostly I just tangled up my line all the time. So, and over lunch, we stopped on this island. I said, could you just show me a few, uh, demonstrate how to cast better? And he was standing there in the river, and it was just picture perfect. He was an artist. He was just absolute, like, so accurate. It was amazing to watch how he worked that fly across the top of the river. And I said, it, you know, it's, it's perfect the way you do it. And he looked at me, and he says, oh, Pastor Jeff, there's no such thing as the perfect cast. But, I'm, you, but fly fishing is in pursuit of the perfect cast. You're always pursuing it, the perfect drift, the perfect cast. And I thought about that a lot. I think that's like the Christian life. We're in pursuit of a life that reflects Jesus perfectly. We never arrive there, this side of eternity, because we're imperfect people. But we're living lives in pursuit of that, and the pursuit is worth it. That's what Colton said to me that day in the river. He said, the pursuit is worth it, because we grow in the process. That's what it means to pursue holiness. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Don't conform to the world and your own desires, but pursue a life that reflects the one who called you, Jesus. So first, pursue holiness. That's what he's saying to us. Make it your life's ambition to be more and more surrendered to Christ. In 2 Peter 3, verse 14, he tells us to be diligent and persistent in these things, that we should be without spot or blemish. Now, back in chapter 2, verse 13, he calls those who preach falsely blots and blemishes. So he's drawing a contrast between those that have, are blots and blemishes because of their false teaching and those of us who pursue faith in Jesus without spot or blemish. But he's also doing something else there. When he says without spot or blemish, what he's referring to is the Old Testament sacrificial system. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial lamb was to be spotless and pure. 
had to be inspected by the priests. And of course, we know that when Jesus came on the scene, John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Only the perfect, spotless Lamb of God could permanently, ultimately remove sin. And that's what we have in Christ. So Peter is in this phrase telling us to place our security and our trust in the Lamb of God without spot or blemish. Our pursuit is not personal perfection, but our pursuit is personal devotion to the perfect Lamb of God. Second, don't get carried away. That sounds funny, I know. He doesn't mean don't get excited, but don't allow yourself to be swept away or carried away by those who would mislead you and deceive you. That's been a theme throughout his letter. He uses the phrase, take care or be on your guard. 2 Peter 3, verse 17, he puts it this way. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care, he says, that you are not carried away. There's that phrase with the error of lawless people, and lose your own stability. We'll talk about some of these phrases here. Some translations say, be on your guard, be watchful, take care that you're not swept away, carried away, and lose your secure position, your place of strength, your own stability. Different ways that it's translated. What's he talking about here? He's talking about falling from a position of security. In fact, let's stop and think about who wrote this. Peter wrote this. And Peter is saying, be cautious, take care, be on your guard that you do not fall away from a position of strength. Now, Peter knows something about falling away. You might remember the story in Matthew chapter 26 when he says, Jesus predicts that all will fall away because of him. Peter stands up and says, Lord, even if everyone else falls away, I never will. And we know what happened. He did fall away. In fact, there's another passage in Luke chapter 22 that's fascinating. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, which is Peter's name, before Jesus changes it to Peter, Satan is asked to sift you as wheat. You're going to be tested, in other words. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And then Jesus says, but after you have fallen and turned back. That's curious. Jesus says, I pray that you would not fail. Your faith would fail. But after you have fallen and turned back, he says, strengthen your brothers. I think that's exactly what he's doing right here in 2 Peter 3. Strengthening us, brothers and sisters of Christ, just as Peter is, by his own experience. He's he's something of an expert in falling. And he's teaching us from his own experience. Strengthening us by what he says. And he says, don't be carried away. This image of being carried away is a little bit of a frightening one if you think about it. Being swept away. Uh, what, what is it that would carry us away? How do people get carried away? Well, for one thing, the crowd. Remember the days of crowds? Remember back over a year ago when there was crowded ballparks or crowded concerts or crowded amusement parks? Maybe you don't miss those days at all, but I can remember vividly going to Wrigley Field with my kids when they were young and we're trying to get to the bathroom and there's a crowd and I'm holding on that hand because if I lose my little guy's hand in a crowd, you, how do you, you can't, it's tough to find him again. You can't see him and he's moving in the wrong direction. And when you're trying to move against the crowd, it's difficult. It's easier just to turn and go with the flow. Spiritually speaking, I think that's one of the things that carries us away. It's hard to swim upstream. It's hard to go against the flow of traffic. The crowd can carry us away. Fear of of being rejected, of being thought foolish, of missing out can carry us away. And frankly, our own hearts. Don't make the mistake of thinking that your own heart is perfect and pure. It isn't. The Bible says you, you really can't trust your heart perfectly apart from Christ. My heart will lead me astray. I don't need any help from any outside source to be carried away. My own heart can do it, and so can yours. So Peter says, be careful, take care, watchful, be on your guard that you are not carried away. But by lawless people, that sounds like a weird phrase. It sounds like what, what, like wild people living out in the, in the woods. No, he, he means those who follow no law except that of their own heart and their own sinful desires. And that's our culture. Those who, are, who, who have no law or no guide other than what they themselves think is right. That's what Peter's saying. Be careful, be watchful, that you're not carried away, and lose your stability. All right, what's our stability then? What is our own stability? Well, it's the church answer. You already know this. It's Jesus. The all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. He's your secure position. He's your strong place. He's your stability. This is why the Apostle Paul says to us in 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, meaning the doctrine of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 
He's saying, if you shift off of Christ as central in your heart and life, you not only damage your own life, but you can lead others astray. That's precisely what Peter is warning us about. Don't be carried away by the crowd, by your own fears, your own heart, or by shifting, drifting at all off of Jesus Christ as your secure position, as your place of security. All right, how do we do this then? Well, this is the main point, point three, grow in grace. This is what Peter's getting at here. The best way we can guard against being swept away, carried away, misled, or deceived is to continually grow in grace. Now, we have to talk about exactly what this means. Um, and let's look at 2 Peter 3, verse 18. But Peter says it right here, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Growing in grace and the knowledge of Jesus. Now, here's what I observe. Some of you are trying to come to Christianity in kind of a piecemeal way. You're coming on your own terms for specific reasons. You want insight or discernment for a particular decision you have to make. You want strength to get through a particular hardship. You want comfort for some pain you're experiencing. You want some kind of aid or help or blessing in some area of your life. But Christianity fundamentally doesn't work that way. Now, don't misunderstand. In Jesus, all of those things are available and more. But it's an all or nothing deal. Jesus is not your divine ATM machine. You can't just come and try to get something when you need it on your own terms. You're either surrendering fully to his grace with all that you are, or you're not. I don't mean you're morally perfect. I don't mean you always get it right. But to become a Christian is not to extract what you need from God on occasion. It's to give yourself wholly to him and allow him then to begin to change you. So when Peter tells us to grow in grace, he's saying something very specific. Christianity is, it, it's an, as I said, an all or nothing thing here. This is why in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has caused us to be born again into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's caused, the Bible calls us to this new life, this new birth, this born-again reality that is not something I choose or that I manufacture or that I conjure up at times. You see, the Bible is not calling all people in general to be better. That would be foolish and, quite frankly, impossible. It's calling us to surrender our lives to the grace of Jesus and be made new by his strength and by his power. Here's how C.S. Lewis puts this in his classic work, Mere Christianity. He says, niceness, wholesome, integrated, good personality, it's a good thing. And we must try by every medical, educational, economic, and political means in our power to produce a world where as many people as possible grow up and be nice. Just as we must produce a world where all have plenty to eat. But we must not suppose that even if we succeed in making everyone nice, we should have saved their souls. A world of nice people, content in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world, and might even be more difficult to save. For mere improvement is not redemption. Though redemption always improves people, even here and now, and will in the end improve them to a degree we cannot yet imagine, God became man to turn creatures into sons, not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. I love that phrase, Improvement is not redemption. The message of the gospel, friends, is not moral improvement. It's not helping you clean up your act or get your life together. It's a whole new life. That's what it means to grow in grace. Let me, let me try to illustrate this for you uh, by drawing something here that hopefully will make sense to you. When, when a person, an individual, comes to faith in Jesus Christ, so we just draw a little person here, when a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ, represented here with the cross, of course, meaning when they recognize that Jesus' death on the cross is sufficient for the forgiveness of their sins, meaning they recognize they have sins, they are sinful, and they have no hope but the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. When Jesus was crucified, dying, he said, it is finished. So the finished work of Jesus, when that happens to you, by placing your faith in Jesus, the Bible describes two fundamental shifts that instantly happen. Number one, you are justified. And number two, you are adopted. 
These things are not processes. They're things that happen in that moment that you trust in Jesus. Let me explain. To be justified is a, is a legal term. It means you are legally pardoned from your sin. You were sinful, separated from God because of the corruption of your own heart, and because of Christ's death on the cross, He pardons you, justifies you, makes you right with God, just in God's sight because of Christ. So a person can't get more pardoned. They're either pardoned or they're not. If you stand before the judge and the judge dismisses the, all charges, they're dismissed. You can't get more free. You're free. The word adoption is a relational term. So at the same time we're legally pardoned, we're also relationally welcomed and accepted into the family of God. These things are true about you when you trust in Christ. So to grow in grace doesn't mean I become more adopted or more justified. That's already perfectly true because of what Jesus did at the cross if you placed your trust in him. So you can't incru increase or improve your status. So what does growing in grace mean? Here's what it means. Even though you can't become more justified or more adopted, what it means is you can grow in your understanding, in your knowledge, in your experience of, in the power of, in the implication and impact of those realities into every area of your life. The way that you think, the way that you speak, the way that you treat people, the way that you interact in your business, at home, with all, that this reality, that I'm forgiven and free, and that I'm welcomed and accepted in the family of God, and nothing can change that, should permeate all of who I am and who you are. That's what it means to grow in grace. It doesn't mean that I grow and earn God's favor. That's already happened. And if you, if you don't get this, I, I hope this helps you. To come to faith in Jesus means because of what he did on the cross, you are pardoned, you are justified, and you're adopted into his family. Those of you who may have adopted children, they're in the family, right? You can't get more adopted. You're, you belong. You're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. You have all the status and privilege of the family. But it may take a child who's maybe come out of the foster care system or an abusive home or an orphanage. It may take a while for them to live as if that's true. So that's what growing grace means. This is true. Now learn to live that way. Now learn to live like this is actually true of you. It takes, and that's a lifetime pursuit, friends. Let's go back again to our... So when Peter tells us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's what he's saying. Continue to grow. Do you know what the uh, top cable television show for 2020 was? Can you guess? I had no idea, but I looked it up. It's a show called The Curse of Oak Island. Ever heard of it? Well, it's, Oak Island is in Nova Scotia, and there's this group of treasure hunters that since for about eight years, since 2014, have been digging all over the island, massive shafts and holes, looking for buried treasure. There's all kinds of legends about that. And apparently they've been doing this for eight seasons or nine seasons, and they haven't found it yet. But they keep looking. Now imagine you own some property. And on your property, you find an ancient gold coin. And, you think, and, and some expert tells you that it's priceless in value. And there must be a lot more on your property. And you never dig, you never look, you never search for anything more. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? I mean, you might, you might own property on which sits a treasure of inestimable value, infinite worth, and you never look for it? You never dig? Because you just got the gold coin? In a way, I think for many of us as Christians, that's exactly how we are. We, we, we got the gold coin Jesus. We're, we're justified and adopted, but we don't dig. We don't search. We don't grow. And so Peter's saying, grow in the grace and the knowledge. In other words, dig, dig, because Jesus has so much more for you there. So much more for you. Never be satisfied in the knowledge that you have because there's more of him. This is how Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 18. But the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, this is his prayer now, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Paul's prayer is that we would grow in our knowledge, not so we would be really smart. The goal of the Christian life is not more information, not, be, not to become like religious eggheads, but transformation. It's not to know more information, but to be transformed by the knowing of Jesus. It's relational knowledge. It's growing in the knowledge of who he is and what he's done. Digging for riches. And isn't it amazing to think that you'll, you'll never come to the end of his grace. You'll never exhaust it. You'll never plumb the depths of it. There's always more for you. 
That's what Peter's saying. Think about this. He's wrapping up his letter. In fact, Peter is soon to die. He's going to die a martyr's death. He's going to be executed by Emperor Nero. Among the last things he ever pens to the churches, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If I could give you any in- encouragement, friends, he's saying, my parting words to you is never stop growing, never stop digging, never stop learning. God has so much more for you. In fact, the best way to protect yourself from being carried away or from being distracted or discouraged is to continually grow. And remember, he's writing this to a church, to a group of Christians. You cannot grow the way God wants you to grow in grace in isolation. I mean, you can, you can study and you can learn. I do that and so should you. But you need to do it in community with other believers. Dig for treasure together, in other words. Because God wants to supply every need of yours by his glorious riches in Christ. One of the best signs that we're growing in the knowledge of Jesus is that there's more grace in our life. We're more gracious people. Think about it this way. Peter's saying, this is how we wait well. We're holiness-pursuing, truth-embracing, grace-displaying, Christ-exalting followers of Jesus. If that sounds high and lofty, that's a lifetime pursuit. It doesn't mean it's, I know it feels unattainable, but that's what God wants for you. A holiness pursuing, a truth embracing, a grace displaying, and a Christ exalting life. That's worth giving your life to. That's what he's called us to. Let's pray. God, thank you that the riches of your grace are inexhaustible and we will never come to the end of them. Thank you that we can dig our whole life long and always you will give us more. I pray that we would never get tired of growing in the grace and knowledge of who you are, Jesus. Thank you for justifying us, for adopting us, and for inviting us into this life. It's like no other. We give you all the praise and glory now and forever. Amen.